Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are watching this webinar. For the ones who don't know me, I am Virginia Ungar, the current president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce today to two very distinguished psychoanalysts and also friends of mine who are going to have an exchange of ideas on this online platform, Florence Guignard and Ruggiero Levy. We will be able to watch them exchanging their ideas on the theme of our incoming 52nd IPA Congress in July. And the theme of this Congress is the infantile and its multiple dimension. You are able to see and to see the, the link to register. If you want to register, you will be welcome. As I said, we will attend a conversation, an exchange of ideas. Um, there is no text that will be shown, but you have a short text uh, from them. If you want to download it, it you can do it uh, when, whenever you want. Uh, in approximately one hour, uh, from now, we will open the discussion from the audience, but you can send your questions, writing them on the right side of the question panel from the start of the webinar. I imagined this meeting as an exchange, a conversation between colleagues, and I invite you all to join us in an atmosphere of conviviality. I will be leaving you sh very soon with our guests because I'm sure I know that they have a very interesting things to tell us on the infantile. Before we start our your this exchange of ideas, I will briefly introduce you to Florence and Ruggiero. And I can say that it is only just a formality as it could take up a lot of time of this webinar so long with the backgrounds of our two guests to be presented. So now I will introduce you to Florence Guignard. Florence Guignard is a Swiss and French clinical psychologist researcher and psychoanalyst. She's the past vice president and training analyst of the SPP, the Paris Psychoanalytic Society. She's a training member of the IPA Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis. She's a former chair and a president. Uh, uh, currently, she's consultant at the IPA COCAP, and I will tell you, COCAP is the Committee of Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis. She founded the APE in 1984, and the CPA, the Association for Child and Adolescent Psychoanalysis in, 19, in Europe, in 1994, I had the pleasure to be invited to give a talk some years ago. And she chaired, the team of the L'Anne Psychanalytique Internationale. This is the French edition of the International Journal. Her, some, her books are Au Bif de l'Infantile, Epitre à l'Objet, Quel Psychanalyse pour le 20 e siècle. In 2015, Psychoanalytic Concepts and Technique in Development, Psychoanalysis, Neurosciences and Physics. Obif, let me tell you a good, some good, really good news that Obif de l'Infantile aujourd'hui will be published very soon, translated into English. In, in, I think that it's ready to be released and we will be happy to have it. Um, there is the, the, I, the infantile in psychoanalytic practice today 
let me see if I, yes. Uh, IPA collections, two books to be issued in 2022. We are waiting for them. La Cica, Le Psicanalyst dans la Cité and auto, autobiograph, Autobiography issued more than, uh, Florence also, you know, wrote and published more than 200 psychoanalytic papers in French, in English, in Italian, in Spanish, Portuguese, and Turkish psychoanalytic reviews in a collective books in French, English, and German. So now Ruggiero Levy, psychoanalyst. We will wait for the slide to come. It takes some time. Ruggiero Levy is a psychoanalyst full member and training analyst of the Psychoanalytic Society of, from Porto Alegre, Brazil. He's former president of, the, of that society, the, the Psychoanalytic Society of Porto Alegre, chair, chair, current chair of the IPA Working Parties Committees, keynote paper major lecture at the, at the 50th um, IPA Congress in Buenos Aires, um, 2017, we met in Buenos Aires, and he's a former ex-IPA board member from 2011 to 2013 and from 2013 to 2015. He's professor and supervisor of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in the courses of specialization in children, adolescents, and adult psychotherapy. Author of many books, chapters, scientific papers published in regional, national, and international psychoanalytic reviews. So now that I have introduced um, both of our guest speakers today, uh, I want to particularly thank them for agreeing to participate in this conversation and this exchange of ideas and you have in front of you the plan we already did the welcome introduction now florence will talk for some a short time then ruggiero then they will have a discussion or an exchange of ideas as i prefer to say between the two of them and at some point, we will open the question from the audience. But as I said, you can write your questions just from now on, on the panel, on the question part of the panel on your right hand side. OK, we listen to you. Well, my greetings to all of you. And my deep gratitude to the organizer of this webinar. First of all, to our president and my dear friends, Virginia Ungar, who makes us the honor to be our moderator today. As she said, I published in 1996 the first book about the infantile. It was uh, in English. I, I'm sorry, I don't see me. Can you change the camera? Because I would like to see my image. Is it possible, Kate? No. We are. Uh, we see you, Florence. I can yes. see you. I, I would. I would like to see me too to control also when. Did you, sorry, did you click, do you have your, the camera? No, That's because the panel of, of the conversation is hiding my image. So, so you can, you can touch the panel control, you can touch the, you know, there is a yellow button, okay, fine. it will go down. Okay, fine, okay. Now, fine, it's okay. <laughs> So, in 1996, I published my first book in French on the infantile, um, and in which I proposed to create a specific concept by making a noun 
from the adjective infantile that is omnipresent in Freud's work. My aim was to get rid of the dichotomy child-adult that is still dominating psychoanalytic thinking today with its recurrent penumbra of associations, Bian would have said. With this uh, penumbra uh, imply that a successful analytic treatment should bring the child part of the human being to mature and in the end to disappear. Well, this book, first book was fairly successful, had two editions, was immediately translated into four languages. But this is interesting because three of these uh, uh, languages were Romanic languages, i.e. Italian, uh, Italian, Spanish and um, Portuguese. The, the fourth one was Turkish. It was not English. I didn't have the, the opportunity to have it translated in English at the moment. And on the contrary, when another book of mine, much later, published in 2015 in French, was accepted for a public a translation and publication in English at the New Library of Psychoanalysis, so psychoanalytic concept, you have the title. My excellent and well-known translator, Andrew Weller, told me that it was really impossible in English to make a noun with infantile. He proposed me to me various side issues as uh, such as uh, infantile part, infantile trends and so on. And I felt really embarrassed. Finally, the book was, we, we managed, the two of us, and the book was issued at, just before the Congress of London. It was on the shelves of the, of the libraries there. And it was also there that I had the surprise to see that the, the next topic of the next IPA Congress, 20, 2021, was the infantile. So it passed, you know, the run. However, the story continues because recently I listened to the excellent webinar of Jan Abram and uh, Bob Hinchelwood, two authors that I admire very much and I listen to much pleasure. And um, Jan Abram finished and ended her presentation with the following sentence, I quote her. My main aim here has been to convey how Winnicott's concept of holding includes all the necessary ingredients of psychic growth that the mother provides for her infant for the rest of their psychic life. This is, she says, why there is no such things as the infantile in Winnicott's clinical paradigm. So it's very interesting. We have to work for this Congress because it seems that there must be somewhere uh, either a linguistic or maybe also a conceptual misunderstanding or difficulty to, to, to agree on the concept of infantile. So today I'm just propose, proposing to explain or to, to, to present my concept, my own concept of the infantile. And I am very grateful to Dr. Ruggiero Levy who will stimulate my thinking but with his very pertinent and subtle comments and questions. So, I consider the infantile as a basic structure on the edge of, of our animality. The infantile is what I would call a soft structure, complex and soft, permanent, permanently moldable, issued from the constant pulse 
of instinctual drive forces. On the frontier of the unconscious and the preconscious system, the infantile is also the locus of primal fantasies and sensory motors ex experience. Consequently, it's also the most acute point of our nonverbal emotions and feelings. It can be found even in the most severe pathologies provided one doesn't confuse the, these with the normal organization of the infantile. Irreducible, unique, and therefore universal, the infantile is the means by which our mind comes into being through all the developments of its uh, psychic bisexuality organized by edible components. The concept also covers our hallucinatory activity and the proto-symbolic preforms that are emerging permanently in all our mental activities. Until we die, it continues to act simultaneously at the level both of the secondary processes of functioning and at the primitive mechanism level. Its preform gives the, their vigor and underlying drive efficiency to more mature organization, setting the tone of our personality as a subject in our usual adult mode of functioning. Now, several so-called soft structure concepts were proposed about the object of cathexis. The first and most famous one is precisely one of Winnicott's. It's Winnicott's transitional object concept that he developed then with transitional object and transitional phenomena, space and so on. Marian Milner also proposed a soft concept with her malleable object. Another very important one that was reworked for, with, by many authors, among which uh, René Roussillon in France. On the side of the subject now, not the object but the subject, there are also soft structures, conceptualization. Of course, the first and well-known one is the, the one of the subject. Uh, you, you, I just mentioned Kohut, but there are many authors who dealt with that. And in France, the translation of self, again, a question of translation, the self uh, should have been translated by le soi, le soi, S-O-E, S-O-I. And it had not, uh, it was not very successful, and I guess it was because it was too close to um, Carl Gustav Jung's uh, views. But the late Raymond Kahn developed very interesting views on the subject, he called the subject, and the process of subjectalization. Now let's come back to the infantile before. Ruggiero will intervene. My daily analytic practice with patients from birth to old age, my long experience as a training analyst and a supervisor, as well as the way I understand Freud's, Klein's, Behrens, and other major author metapsychology, brought me to consider that the soft structure of infantile is an everlasting component of every human being, as it is intrinsically bound to the continuous surge of the drives and their object cathexis, as well as to the permanent movement of identification and their consequences, which is the feeling of self-identity with all its narcissistic pathologies, but also with all the creative capacities of any human being.
Now we will draw. Are you listening to me? Yes. yes. Yes, now it's okay. So I would like to, to uh, say good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, very much Virginia Unger and uh, all the IPA webinar team for the opportunity to be here in a very interesting and relevant preparatory activity uh, for the next IPA Congress. For me, it's really an enormous satisfaction and an honor to have the opportunity to dialogue and to make some questions with, uh, to Florence Lignard, that is a such relevant author to psychoanalysis and who brought so many contributions to us. Since Freud, several authors and poets have mentioned the infantile, mostly in its adjective connotation, but some also in its substantive connotation. For example, Meltzer always said that we need to look for and to make contact with the child in the session. And Milton Nascimento, one of the greatest Brazilian singers and songwriters, once said, there is a brat, a kid, always living in my heart. Every time the adult swings, he comes to give me his hand. I think we should be able to keep this breath alive inside us for the rest of our lives. Although there are multiple dimensions of the infantile in psychoanalysis, for example, the precipitate of the infantile object relations with their drives colors, the identificatory precipitate and all the vicissitudes of narcissism, I would like today to place my emphasis on the vital and vitalizing aspects of the infantile in the personality of the subject throughout his life. The healthy child is a fragile being, dependent but constantly growing in permanent transformations because of its vital impulse, ultimately because of its drives. Moreover, they have the ability to face reality, often extremely adverse, especially in Brazil and in Latin America, through their imagination, their dreams, in short, they, uh, their ability to live in the space of illusion. The space of illusion is built through his innate creativity, his symbolic function proper of the human being and the presence of another human being, the mother, the parents, capable enough of offering him the security that the little being will continue to be alive. It seems essential to me that the adults, in order to continue growing, evolving, learning for the, for the rest of his life, could keep this infantile alive within himself, with his vitality, his capacity to transform himself, to imagine, to be creative, that is to expand his mind through infinite symbolizations. Here in Brazil, recently a Brazilian psychoanalyst, Bernardo Tanis, published a book about the infantile in psychoanalysis, making relevant contributions trying to establish the relations of the infantile with the mode of psychic functioning and all its manifestation in psychoanalytic clinics. Among other no notions, Tennis also defines the infantiles as something alive in movement that can give way to a symbolizing historization to the new, to new genesis, keeping alive the flame of creativity. However, from my point of view, you, Florence Guignard, have made one of the most original and consistent contributions to the understanding of the infantile in psychoanalysis, and its originality derives from several aspects. First, because stressing the substantive connotation of the infantile, you describe it 
in all its metapsychology. You describe the genetic, the topographical, the dynamic, and the economic dimension of the infant eye in the mind of the subject. Second, even though several authors have mentioned the presence of the infant eye of the patient in the analytic session, you describe the excitement or turbulence that occurs between patient and analyst when the infantile of the patient enters into resonance with the infantile of the analyst. That is, you study and describe the phenomenon taking into account the intersubjective exchange existing in the analytic field. But with the intention of expanding and deepening your ideas and Today, this will be my, my first and, and, and principal goal here. I would like to ask you some questions. Bjorn wrote a lot, a lot about the negative capability and the importance of tolerating the not knowing and the unknown in order to have access to a new experience. Meltzer spoke a lot about tolerance to mystery in order to construct the unknown through imagination. But what I found interesting and original is that you link tolerance to not knowing to the emergence of the analyst's infantile triggered by the patient infantile in the session. Could you please, Florence, tell us more about this interesting idea? Well, I contend that a healthy infantile has a good balance between its uh, ego drives, L, H, K, K uh, to, to mention B and again. You can observe already in infants how attention and curiosity are stimulated by a new situation. Omnipotence from my point of view, comes later, I mean, one second later, as a defense against the disappointment of a repeated failure to handle or to understand a situation. Of course, the infantile has several, several uh, destinies, uh, namely to become more mature and to learn from experience. My point is that this soft structure is constantly renewed in each of us as it is anchored in the constant push of the drive, as I said, from birth to death. Now here I would like to examine with you the particular situation of the psychoanalyst regarding the end of their personal analytic cure. For every human being, repression is a necessary mechanism to keep on using in order to be able to keep on discovering and learning more from experience. Thus, it is admitted that a new, healthier, repression mechanism of repression will keep on functioning in ordinary patients when their analytic cure is over however such a mechanism will not easily take place for the analysts because their professional activity requires for them to stay constantly close to the point of emergence of, of emergence of their unconscious in their preconscious. It's the price to pay in order not to repress their sensitivity to the pain of the patient's infantile, a sensitivity acquired or at least enhanced through their own experience of suffering and their analytic experience of elaborating it in their analysis. I consider that the analyst experiences the disarray and the feelings of loss 
in his own infantile when these occur in the patient's infantile. In other words, his projective identification is trained to feel, to feel other patients, other people, other people's emotion and reactions. Nevertheless, such an acquired ability is challenging the feeling of identity of the analyst who might develop narcissistic defenses against this capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Thank you. But uh, to, to go on uh, in, our, in our conversation, uh, in your work, you state that uh, in the analytic relationship, there are moments when the infantile of the analyst enters in resonance with the infantile of the patient, generating an excitement, a turbulence, that can lead to the formation of blind spots. The resumption of the capacity for representation from his emotion experience and his reverie would also be a function of uh, his infantile as a function of personality, Florence. Well, you know, um, the blind spot is not the automatic result of the meeting of the two infantiles. It happens only on very specific conditions. I mentioned the importance of the rhythm of communication that takes place progressively uh, in the encounters of the patient and with the analysts. Although one is not always conscious of this parameter of the rhythm, it plays an important role for in our everyday practice. For instance, when you choose, you have to choose the moment to give an interpretation or not to give it. It's a question of feeling. You feel that you are going to repress from giving an interpretation unless you give a stopper interpretation but we shall uh, talk about it later my point is um, that when the analyst feels a sudden break of this rhythm of communication and uh, he feels an impalpable experience of loss he will then observe as a reaction an unusual arousal of excitement in in the analytic field neither the feeling of loss nor the excitement can be consciously linked either by the analyst or the patient with an element of the present situation here and now i consider that this particular moment as a signal that something is missing this is what i call a blind spot Okay, thank you, thank you again, uh, Florence. And and to go deep in in that uh, in that question, uh, you point out that to overcome a blind spot, the analyst must overcome the reassuring temptation to resort to stopper interpretations and remain in listening to the preconscious conscious part of his infantile to try to repair the rupture in the rhythm of the relationship and diffuse feeling of loss of the supporting object. Could you please tell us a little more about this, uh, Florence? Yes. May, may I interrupt? Sorry, yeah. may I interrupt you? You yeah, have, of course. Oh, I think that the, my infantile is suffering now because <laughs> You know, the, I imagine this as a conversation before of the two of you, but I'm suffering, I think, of this uh, feeling excluded. This is my infantile in action, feel excluded from the primal scene. No, but this is a joke just to, to make it more, you know, more, you know, collegial. So um, let me intervene here because to say only two things, not more. One is that we dealt with the issue of the translation. We weren't with Sergio Nick, 
who is in charge of the Congress, and we are both child analysts, so uh, we were not lost in translation, like the movie, because Florence helped us a lot, because we wanted the infantile, and we came to know that the infantile could sound pejorative. But nevertheless, we decided, helped by Florence, to have this as the title of the next Congress, and listening to you both, uh, you know, talking, I think that, as you said, Ruggiero, the most relevant contribution by Florence, you know, to place the infantile in the transference and counter-transference relationship. This is, I understood your ideas well from the books and from our conversation, and it's interesting that we are now, you are now talking about an obstacle that can come into this, you know, into the analytic field, the blind spots. So now, uh, please, the organizers, you can keep me muted. <laughs> okay, thank you, Virginia. Uh, so, so going forward in, in, uh, in the comprehension of this, uh, what happened in the analytic encounter, uh, I would like to listen a little bit, uh, Florence, about uh, the stopper interpretations. Yes. Well, <clears throat> you see, I, I <clears throat> thank you, Virginia. That's very. That was very necessary that you you had you gave these position and this is what is fascinating in this debate and what will be so fascinating in in the congress itself of course it's um, the different points of view about the infantile now i was talking of the blind spot and ruggiero asked me about the stopper interpretation so i have to come back to the blind spot because my point is that suddenly there is in the analytic field a feeling of loss something is lost but we don't know what and as we all know if we lose something then we have to start with a mourning process but if you don't know what you have lost it's very difficult you know we know with analysis that as long as we don't point out what is the real loss we have experienced, it's very difficult to start having a, a mourning process. And the blind spot just exemplifies this situation. We don't know, we feel something has been lost, we don't know what. Because we are analysts, we think that uh, logically it should be it should be in relation to either the ego or uh, an, an internal object of the subject or, my, or maybe the analyst as well, uh, but we don't know what. And as we say in French, nature hates void, la nature a horreur du vide. Um, the first reaction of uh, the, the analyst is to give an interpretation. It's not very e it's not very difficult to give an interpretation. We have plenty, you know. We we are used to give interpretation. But the problem is that at that moment, since we don't know what is the nature of the loss, we are probably uh, we we cannot but give what I call a stopper interpretation. In French, it's une interpretation bouchon, you know, a plug interpretation. And uh, uh, fortunately, the patient will come to our help because uh, it will not work if you give a stopper interpretation. It's just an interpretation to stop the kind of hemorrhagia that happens when we have lost something we don't know what but of course it's uh, it can help just um, a few minutes it's not going to help the the, the general uh, 
conduct of the of, of the analytic cure. Now, I don't know if I have time to give a little example of it or not. Virginia. Yes, I suppose you have, uh, Florence. Yes, yes, I, don't I know, Virginia. Yes, yes, you have. It. It's a short. I I think that yes, you. We, yes. Let me but, tell you that we still have uh, twenty minutes, approximately fifteen fine. to twenty minutes before we open the discussion from okay. the public. Fine. It's it's very short and it helps to understand what is this question of a blind spot and so on. An experienced analyst went through a painful period of total absence of meaningful uh, communication with her young patient, a boy of 11 years old. During a session when she experienced a particularly acute feeling of helplessness in front of the negativity expressed by the boy's attitude, she couldn't help feeling irritated when just out of the blue, the boy who was doing nothing for, uh, of his session, put a small toy on her own feet, food. And she just told him impulsively, oh, you're really treating me like a thing, as if I were a thing. And of course, immediately she felt terribly embarrassed and guilty about this reaction, and she asked a colleague for a supervision. Together, the two analysts discovered the blind spot the analyst had been falling to, and this is the blind spot. The boy was an adopted child, born from a single alcoholic mother who was totally unable to take care of a baby. He spent the first three years of his life in the streets, was then put into an orphanage and adopted by soon after by a loving, very loving family, but who lives in another country, speaks a language totally foreign to the one of the child. Things went fairly well until three years later, the family adopted a second child. At that point, the boy totally collapsed, both at home and at school, showing a severe so-called ADHD syndrome, attention disorders, hyperactivity syndrome. During the first year of therapy, he calmed down and stopped breaking everything around him, which was, he was doing it also in the sessions. But then on, nothing more seemed to happen, except this arousal of negative excitement in the analyst. Although she wasn't yet conscious of it, the enactment due to the analyst blind spot had a very positive issue, and this is my point. Because she verbally expressed her infantile verbally expressed unconsciously in projective identification with this abandoned child, you're really treating me as if I were a thing. In reality, you, you, you understood, he was the one that had been treated as a thing during the first year of his life. Needless to say, the boy was still totally unable to even to remember and even to feel something about this tragic traumatic situation and impossible to talk in, in the sessions about it. Confronted to her unconscious identification to the victim of such an unspeakable tragedy, the analyst needed a little help the other analyst to stop being also identified with the splitting and the repressive uh, movement of the of the trauma in the child and because she is an analyst 
she was able to verbalize something unconsciously. Uh, that was exactly to the point. And this is uh, the advantage of being in a blind spot, but it, we need a help of a third. Thank you, thank you, Florence, for the very clear and uh, and uh, dramatic uh, clinical vignette that you sent to us that, that uh, clarify a lot uh, your concept of uh, blind spot and all the, the that occurs uh, between analyst and patient in these moments. But I, I would like to make a, a, a small detour in our uh talking about the infant type because uh, while it's noted Florence, that you are strongly anchored in freud and metapsychology it is also noted that especially in your contributions on the clinical analyst patient encounter the contributions of baron j Capo, melanie klein Bion, Meltzer, and winnicott are strongly present could you tell us please how this integration happened in, in, your, in your professional life? Well, you know, I'm not going to, to tell you all my life because it would be too long because I am so old. But <laughs> I, have always, I have always been interested in, in other people's point of view. And I was lucky enough to have very interesting and important people um, since my studies in the, at the University of Geneva. Um, I also had the possibility, because I was given a fund to, to spend six months uh, in, in Great Britain, um, I was lucky enough to, to visit a lot of uh, establishments of childcare there. I also was lucky enough to work with uh, the Sandlers, and Marie Sandler was a very good friend of mine. She, Comes, she was coming also from Geneva. So Hampstead Clinic, uh, Guy's Hospital, uh, and Tavistock Clinic, where I was lucky enough to listen to Winnicott himself. So, you know, it's there are all these possibilities and opportunities to... to uh, I also had other opportunities later on to, to work with uh, Anna Siegel, uh, uh, Herbert Rosenfeld, uh, many, many people of, uh, of the British uh, society. And I also have um, later on good opportunities uh, both to read Blecher, Racker, and all the first pioneers of, uh, of uh, Latin American psychoanalysis, Aberasturi, that will that has been translated now into French and will be published soon. And then I had the opportunity to work with you, Ruggiero, and other people, and Virginia, and uh, Clara Nemas, many people of Latin America. It, it's always for me a, something that brings me a lot of things, a lot of new points of view. Uh, in North America, I also had the capacities to, to work with many people, um, uh, less in, in webinars, but uh, many in the CAPS um, organization, Center for Advanced uh, Psychoanalytic Studies. So for me, it, I think it, I'm very lucky because I have the, the possibility to compare all these points of view, I hope without losing my own identity. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that uh, the richness of your identity comes from all this diversity of uh, influence and uh, from all this uh, plurality. But now, coming back to the subject of the infantile, I, I would like to, to, to make you another question. Uh, in, in the 12th chapter of your book, Psychoanalytic Concepts and Technique in Development, psychoanalysis, neuroscience, and physics, you state, and I will quote you, uh, a severe and rigid 
post oedipal parental superego is very often the manifest aspect of the imagos projected by the analysant onto the analyst. But the analyst must also take in account in his interpretative choice of the simultaneous projection onto him of the complementary latent imago, that is, a weak ego whose infantile helplessness will be denied by its contrary, the infantile omnipotence. Technically, I think you are pointing something very important because it is very frequent that the analysts remain in an interpretative vertex of the superego severity without results, in an omnipotent and very often irritated way, denying his feelings of impotence in these situations. The analyst infantile is dominating the sin on both sides, right? Leaving the helplessness and denying it through his infantile omnipotence, Florence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I think that uh, omnipot uh, omnipotence is a reaction. Omnipotence is a reaction of the, uh, in contrast to the to the the helplessness. Uh, I think uh, that one has to understand. Uh, investigate where, which is the part of the, uh, which is uh, omnipotent and which is the part that is helpless. Um, and of course, uh, one can, uh, one can see that, uh, well, one can understand that it could be two sides of, of the infantile, or uh, one could think that, uh, what you mentioned, that uh, the child has had a superego that is so severe and so on and so forth. Um, I didn't mention just a moment ago that I worked a lot with Meltzer because he went for 20 years in Paris, uh, three times a year, and I was his live translator. So that's the best way to understand how a people, uh, how somebody is thinking when you have to translate it from scratch. And he, uh, the, why uh, the reason why I mention him uh, is not only because I have learned a lot of things with him. It's also because he was uh, he developed a lot of thinking about the adult part of the personality. And of course, I, I, you might think that I have the esprit de contradiction, contradiction <laughs> spirit. I, I am dealing with the infantile. <laughs> However, I think that whenever you you are confronted to a very severe superego, uh, you have to think of the uh, omnipotent, infantile omnipotence, and you have to, rem to remember that omnipotence is just a reaction to the helplessness of the newborn and the, the, the fragile human, uh, human being. So you can imagine, for instance, a uh, uh, dialogue on the stage between two infantiles, the helpless one and the omnipotent one. And you will quickly detect which is the real, sincere, truthful uh, infantile and which is the denial one, the one who denies this helplessness uh, through omnipotent defenses. Then one of the two is the patient's ego, the other one is of one of his internal object, but one still has to develop and to understand which one is which. Okay, okay. I would, be, I would like to intervene just to share something, but uh, that we, we, I think that the three of us shared 
you know, the experience of having contact with Melzer to learn from him, to listen. He went, he came to Buenos Aires five times. He went to Porto Alegre. I flew to Porto Alegre when he was there. So I think that the three of us, we have, I, I, I have to recognize that Mel's con being in contact with Melzer changed not only my position in psychoanalysis, but beyond this in i think it was a great influence i was never analyzed by him but it, he made me change the you know the 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 way we see life and the world so um i think what ruggero what you asked and you florence uh, you know answered is very important when we have to decide or not to decide to to, to make an interpretation or, or to say something during the session. Because if you confuse to which the omnipotent, that I agree with you, it's a defense against the, the helplessness part of the, the helpless you know, side of the personality, you can make a big mistake. If you talk to this part with the language that used to the other, it could be. Of course, you will fall into a blind spot or make something that is not good for the patient and for the analysis. Okay, please mute me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, really, uh, Meltzer was a very strong influence uh, with uh, all of us, uh, at least here in Porto Alegre, I'm sure, in Buenos Aires and uh, as uh, in, in all over the world, because he, he gave seminars and supervisions in, in France, in Italy, and, uh, and uh, in Latin America, and uh, so he's a very strong influence. Uh, but coming back, uh, uh, Florence, uh, to uh, the training of the future analyst. I would like to to ask you some 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 a question. Uh, so the training and uh, of the future analyst and his mental functioning. Could you expand on your idea that the personal analysis, far from eliminating the analyst infantile, can enable him to better use the limits of his ego as a container of his infantile? and reduce the danger of being seduced into being governed by his infantile that seeks to impose the omnipotence and, and omniscience of his majesty, the baby. And <laughs> this, has, this is related with, was, uh, with what Virginia was, uh, was saying to us uh, before. Yes. Yes. yes, indeed. Well, you know, uh, it will be the last interaction because we are arriving to the time for the questions from the audience. I wanted you to remind you because this is my this is my this is my task today. Okay, Florence. Just in two words, His Majesty the Baby, as Ruggiero said, is a defensive posture. In a, in a child whose space of illusion collapses in front of his experience of helplessness when confronted to the reality principle. But you see, I've seen adults, and I must say sometimes also an analyst, and I'm sure I have been one of them sometimes from time to time, to be in this posture of His Majesty the Baby the one to, who knows, the parents, the learned one. And this is the worst position for an analyst because as long as you think you, you know, you do not learn, and we are running after the patient. I think even Freud said that the patient was always in, a, in advance, was always uh, uh, much advanced much more advanced than the analyst. So we don't have any uh, advantage to be His Majesty the baby who knows everything 
because we are not going to just do our job. Okay, thank you very much for this in very interesting e exchange, but we arrived to the time that, as the slide is showing us, to arrive to the point to the, to the questions. Uh, let me tell you that we have, we have many questions and there we will be only to, you know, to, to read and to present to you some of them. So now I, I will start to read it for you, the first. This is uh, addressed to Florence. Florence, if the infantile is a noun, doesn't imply a an approach to the way that we see infantile ethics, infantile partial or restricted sexual activity, lacks of some ego functions, like parenting, falling in love, and lack of a stable object relationship. I, maybe you can, I don't know. I'm maybe. just rereading it because it's, it's, a, it's a very pertinent question, but I have to. Yes, so. Does, does it deprive an approach to the way that we see infant dialectics? Infantile part or restricted sexual lack of some ego function as parenting. Uh, so it, what we expect, I think, is that if you could give a short answer and then we can you can we can share some other questions, it will be okay. Yes, well I, I would say that uh, we cannot we cannot con con uh, conceive of infantile without conceive of adult part of personality. This is why I quoted, I mentioned uh, Meltzer. Uh, my argument is that infantile doesn't disappear. It's, it, we are going, we are keeping a dialogue, dialogue in ourselves all life long between the infantile part of ourselves and the adult part of ourselves. The adult part has learned from experience, sometimes very uh, with with much pain. Uh, the infantile is always a spontaneous interest in life and very creative, but of course, with all these defenses like omnipotence or his majesty baby rivalry and so on but if we think that uh, the analysis extinguish infantile if it's a very sad point of view uh, you know about analysis and uh, about life this may i say something Virginia? yes of course yes yes yeah, I think that the question is very important because uh, it helps to, to clarify that uh, the fact that uh, Florence and many authors recognize the infantile part of the personality and describe its function into the personality, this not means that there not exist other parts of the personality. The adult parts and all that uh, one learns through experience and all the development of the mind, uh, this also exists into the minds. And I think that the richness is to understand how these parts of personality interact. Yes. 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 Thank you. I have to restrain myself to, to make comments. So a question for Dr. Guignard. Since the concept of the infantile comprises the drives too, how does this manifest itself during analysis? I can think, the person who made the question, of regression, but how else? Oh. Well, it's my French side, you know. <laughs> I was brought up with the, the you know, the, the conviction and, uh, 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 yes, the conviction that drives are functioning all the time. Uh, and uh, we have a big author, that's André Green, who really 
organized, centered all his very rich uh, thinking around the, the fact that drive never stops. The, the needs are satisfied, but not the drive, never, never, yeah. ever. So I wouldn't imagine a living situation without uh, the function of the drives functioning all the time. Now you speak, uh, the, the question asked about regression, this is, might um, be another seminar. Yes. Webinar. Um, because of course there are regression even in child uh, treatment. But well, I don't want to say more. Yes. yes, I think that we should. Maybe we will have to have another seminar, webinar, or seminar devoted to to regression. Yes. So uh, there is another question. Could Dr. Guignard comment on? how she may or may not see her work on the infantile correlating with the writing of Jean Laplanche with his general theory of seduction and the role of the other. Yes. Well, uh, just uh, in a word, I studied rather thoroughly Jean Laplanche uh, theories. I wrote about uh, what he wrote and I think it's very close it, it approached very closely to my um, way of thinking of the seduction and so on. That, that's right. It doesn't prevent me from thinking of the infantile. Mm -hmm. uh, may, may I say something uh, yes, regarding the, the, the previous questions about the regression? Because yeah. I, I think that this is uh, it's very important because the richness of uh, this point of view that Florence is bringing to us and other authors also brought is that uh, is that to to play attention to the synchronic view of the permanent existing of this part of personality that we are calling uh, the infantile and mm -hmm. do not reduce the infantile to regressive aspects, but to vital functions of the personality that are all the time in synchronic relation with other parts of, of, of the relation. And I, I think that uh, this goes uh, on in the sense of, uh, of uh, going forward and not see only the infantile in the regression perspective yes right i agree so may i read okay the the next one is uh, to florence but i think it's to both is the connection of both infantile aspects between analyst and patient are not in touch the blind spot would not be possible to happen Um, well, I think that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah. I would say that if they are not at all in touch, there wouldn't be and there then, would be uh, uh, nothing but a spot, you know. <laughs> so the the problem is that what I, I you take it for granted that there is an analytic process and there is something that's happening and it's a real analysis and not uh, an as if analysis which which might happen also so let's uh, consider what happens in a in a uh, in an analytic process that is functioning fairly well and at that moment we can be sensitive to to blind spot you know the the i would just uh, compare it to <clears throat> when somebody to to a musical uh, metaphor when somebody uh, is thinking pretty right mm. it's okay so suddenly you hear that there is a, a, a wrong note but if somebody never <laughs> thinks uh, properly so 
you cannot even speak about music. Let's go to the next. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this I have to say who wrote this because I have the name. It's Bernardo Tani. Thank you very much, Florence, Ruggiero, and Virginia, for this challenging dialogue and effort you made to present us this fundamental deba debate on the infantile. The notion of infantile is one of the most important Freudian contributions in the last decades with testimony, the clinical study of the unrepresented and trauma. We have the model of dream in Freudian metapsychology and reverie in beyond as one of the paths for symbolization. Roussillon following Winnicott and Green also highlights the way of play and act as another path and possible for representation and symbolization of the unrepresented, infantile, and its traumatic or creative potential. How do you see this, Florence, of course, and Ruggiero, this path in the analysis of the child in the adult? Oh, thank you, Bernardo Tanis. Of course, uh, I know your work, and uh, we had to 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 cut short. But uh, I know that Ruggiero mentioned you, yeah. and uh, that you are very important in this field. So it's nice to have you over listening to us. Well, you know, I would think that the the infant, the, the the child in the adult, or the infantile in the adult, is one of the most interesting parts of our uh, work as analyst, to because um, it's not only to find a traumatic part of the life of our analyzing, which is very important, but it's also to become close to the way the, the, the infantile or the, the child part of the patient experienced something that as an adult we wouldn't consider as very important. This is why we need our own infantile. And I know that you will agree with that. I don't know if I understood and uh, answered your question. Maybe Ruggiero, you would say something. Yes, yes, I would like to say something. And and thank you, Bernardo, for your question and uh, for your contributions in in this field. Uh, uh, since I, uh, when I was listening now to 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 Florence, I made uh, an association. Uh, with uh, child analysis. Uh, when we work with a child, uh, we need to identify with his way of communicating with us. We cannot remain as an adult uh, relation, in a relation with the child. We have to identify ourselves with the child in the session. And I think that with adults, it's, it's the same thing. I mm -hmm. think that in one side, we make contact with the traumatic aspects of the infantile. For example, uh, uh, as the, the clinical vignette that Florence uh, showed to us, that the infantile, the helplessness of, the, of this, this boy was present in, in the session. And uh, the, the analyst kept this. But we also need from my point of view, and I think that you are in agreement uh, with me, that we also need the other part of the infantile of ourselves to, to be able to dream in beyond conception this, this situation, to be able to, to play or to make a squiggle game, as Winnicott would say, with this patient to understand this unrepresented state. Uh, as, as Florence showed to, to us, this little boy was not able to represent all, all his helplessness and all his feeling of abandonment. And this appears in the session uh, as an act. Uh, and uh, the, the analyst uh, would uh, call to dream this situation. Yes. Okay. Uh, may I just add one thing that we discussed yeah. with 
Ujjer or many things, and uh, a part of it we are not going to, we, we will not be able to to communicate with you. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, it's important to, un to understand that from the very beginning of life, projection and introjection are the respiration of the psychic life. So the infantile is also made of the reintroduction, re immediate reintroduction of a slight, a tiny little part of the mother's capacity of reverie. So the infantile is also the, the part of us that is the closest to the search of truth, the search of thinking never is always acquired forever. And I think this is the most creative part of us. Thank you. Now the next question is, has a signature, so I will say who is sending this, is Julio Moreno. He says, mm -hmm. totem and taboo, and taboo, sorry, Freud considered the presence of the infantile in the adult mind as an obstacle to reach the stage that he calls scientific, the most progressive of all phases he conceived, phases he conceived free from any infantile presences. On the other hand, Nietzsche, Nietzsche thought that the most progressive and valuable phase of the human being was the one that he called superhuman or posthuman phase, which he represented not as a, as a wise adult, but simply as a little child. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Julio. <laughs> I agree with Nietzsche. Um, <laughs> because uh, I don't know, you, Roger, we will say if you agree with Nietzsche or not. Uh, because Freud, you know, had a very serious side, very super egoish with himself first, because he was so demanding and he had such a huge ideal, which is fantastic. But, you know, I consider to be, to be in present time, uh, I have very much admiration for a um, um, physician, not not physician in English, a physician. Physicist, sorry, physicist, I... because they have the the possibility both to be extremely demanding, exigent for the for the scientific demonstration they are doing and extremely uh, full of imagination and they force their imagination to be really very active to imagine new hypotheses. I think this is for me the definition of scientific. I, we should all be like that. Okay. Nero, uh, you want to say something, or I go no. to the next? Okay, I go to the next. No, I'm okay. Yeah. okay, okay. The next question is: uh, After listening to the inspiring presentations, I would like to ask the presenters their view on the concept of neutrality and the modifications of its meaning from the classical conception to contemporary psychoanalysis, which rely more deeply in the analyst's intuition or the analyst's, the analyst's feeling, quoted Florence. Who want to start? Ladies well, first, and then I, I, I will follow. Okay. Okay, ladies. Okay, you know, I was lucky enough to listen to two an a very old analyst uh, mine uh, Raymond Saussure and René Spitz who both were analyzed by Freud and believe me what we call the classical um, 
neutrality was not at all the way Freud was working, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. it, it became this this became a kind of super egoish uh, necessary uh, way of you know whenever some some whenever we are in a social group and we cannot work without a social group around uh, we have a uh, we have to make rules and the rules are very good but they have also their bad sides i think the neutrality is something might might be called maybe the respect rather than neutrality we listen to to our patients and we we do not judge their point of view we try to understand and Beyond that, this becomes rigidity, yeah. from my point of view. What do you think, Ruggiero? Yes, I, I think that this question is very, very interesting because it gives the opportunity to, to, to go deep in, into that because uh, I think that have been a lot of misunderstanding about the concepts of uh, neutrality and uh, very often is, it's confused with uh, rigidity and uh, and uh, uh, to be cold, uh, to not having emotions into the session. And I think that all the contemporary contributions and also Freud in his works, we cannot say that he was so neutral. He was uh, he participates a lot in all in all with all his patients but uh, i think that uh, in florent's view and in the contemporary view of the analytic relationship this this encounter must to be a very alive a living relationship very very rich in emotions and uh, this is the best way to to know and to understand the patient and of course all these emotions that are shared in, in the analytic relationship uh, must be transformed in the, in the analyst mind and trying to, to give back to the patient some understanding about what is occurring in, in the session. But uh, as I, I will come uh, back again to the clinical vignette that Florence uh, shown to us, there is moments where the analysts uh, make enactments and this goes beyond his capacity to, to control himself and this mm. is uh, ways where uh, the, the living, rela the, the, the alive relationship is occurring uh, between uh, both of them and the most important is not to to, to say something uh, wrong or, or to act uh, wrongly in a session, but have having the capacity to understand and trying to 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 transform into an understanding what what happened. I would like to say something. I I, I can you know stay muted, but I would like. I think that this is a very important point to you know to revisit and to rediscuss the concept of neutrality i like what you both said florence you you propose respect and ruggero you said something like some like there is no analysis without enactments or acting out from the both the side of the analyst or the patient this is that's why I personally think that neutrality would be an aim, you know, an aim. In the same way that when we form, when we say the fundamental role to the patient, tell whatever comes to your mind, we know that it is impossible at yeah. the beginning of an analysis, but it's an aim. You know, yeah. there is nothing less free than, you know, freer than a, a neurotic you know situation there's no capacity possibility to free. so i think Vir this is yes virginia yes. once uh, you you were here uh, you was here in porto alegre 
and you said something that uh, that stay in my mind that the the ethical position of the analyst is beyond the respect is to make the more psychoanalysis as possible yes this implies that there is moments that we cannot think but we, we have to listen that we are not being able to think as psychoanalysts and to recover uh, our position and uh, this is what uh, Florence describes very well that uh, about the blind spots the stopper interpretations and uh, the efforts of the analyst to uh, to recover the rhythm of communication uh, between uh, between uh, patient and analyst thank you very much i i we are short of time as always when you know we want to continue we have to stop and there are you know i think that maybe i can read two questions let me check okay we have only four minutes two minutes one question let me go to you know i will choose uh, because there is uh, okay uh, let me okay the next one it's it's a very interesting but how would one conceptualize a bright spot and Goldberg is you know <laughs> The, the, bright analyst, the, the bright spot, the analyst experience that he or she understands completely the patient's communication. Okay. Okay, we have two minutes. Just, Sorry. I would consider, yes. Uh, shall I bring Belzer again? The delusion of clarity of mind. I mean, one never, never, ever, ever understand totally somebody else's way. Uh, way to work so but we can have and th this comes to the the congress on intimacy we can have sort of spots that suddenly with somebody else we are totally in in coherence and in in harmony but it doesn't mean that one understand how it works in the other person to to arrive to this harmony so i think blind spot is more it's more it's less grandiose it's, it's more modest it's just a, a false note yeah yeah in my paper about intimacy that i presented in buenos aires i yeah. i thought uh, yes i talked about this moment of attunement when the patient and analyst feel that they, they have reached the same experience. But in general, this uh, is very interesting uh, how you call the bright spot. In general, Beyond would say that this is a transformation into a lucinosis that yes, the analyst have. Yes, yes. Okay, we arrived, you know, to the point that we have to put an end. But this, I am so happy that you accepted this you know to be part of this webinar and it's really stimulating for our upcoming congress and we will continue debating and thank you very much florence and ruggiero uh, for accepting this and to forgive you know to show how you think this is the way i would like to convey this Thank you very much for the organizing team, to Eliana Milona, Kate Wright, they, they worked a lot with us, and the, you know, the, the team, communication teams of the IPA. Thank you all who joined us today to this lovely conversation. And let me announce the upcoming webinar. It will be Masculinidades in Portuguese, masculinities in Portuguese, on Friday, May 21st, from, you know, there is the time there, the usual time, 15 and, and 5.30 BST, 
And the, the presenters will be Rui Aragao Oliveira, Candida C. Holovko, Miguel Carmón Dupine Almeida, I know, we know the three of them, and the moderator as well, Carlos Garifaria, in Portuguese. You are, you are able to register from now on. So thank you very much, and thank you all who joined us in this adventure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ruggiero. Thank you, Virginia. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you, Florence, Virginia, and all the audience. And yes. Thank you.